Uh, this is going to be kind of an interesting use of a functional programming language. Uh, it's a language called Doll. I guess has anybody ever heard of it? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Yeah, a few people. Good deal. Um, so Doll is a attempt to fix some problems with config languages. Sometimes people don't even know that there are problems with config languages. Um, just want to go through a little bit about what a config language is before I get started, and then we'll dive into looking at some of the features that make Doll so interesting. So a config language, I guess text-based seems kind of silly, like I guess all languages are text-based, but um, what I, I guess what I meant by that is um, it's not going to have things like, like, a, like a binary representation. You know, the, lang the script is the language, and it's all together. Um, they're going to be easy to read. You know, you want something that people can open up and look at, uh, and then a structured syntax, something that makes sense. Okay, so as an example, you know, small configs, little to no syntax. So if you're doing something simple with a config language, you want it to be simple and very legible. So this would be an example of that. You can clearly understand what's happening here, that there's a port and some threads, and maybe some sort of logging that's happening. So an initial state of a system. Yeah, as, as things get more complicated, the way you structure things starts to matter a lot. And this is where I think a lot of config languages fall down. Um, I guess one question I'd have is, does anybody here work with configs that are more than 100 lines? Raise your hand if you have configs that are more than 100 lines. Yeah, me, me too. We, we often have, you know, really huge configs. And, and I feel like that's sort of what's missing. But I want to go through some of the other approaches and we'll, we'll come, come back to why I think this is better. But as you can see, there's all kind of structure here. We've got uh, a list, we've got a record, we've got a record, we've got a list of records, some text, and then all different levels of ha are happening. Okay, so um, one thing that often happens in large projects is people stop using config languages. They stop using things like XML and YAML, and they just write code directly. Especially, this is really common with uh, Python programmers and JavaScript programmers, people that already have a scripted language, right? So you'll see them just write a Python script or write a Bash script, um, and I, I don't blame them. Like it makes a lot of sense compared to compared to like large XML files or large JSON files. There's a lot to be said for that. Um, my biggest complaints about doing something like that is just it's easy to write a mistake, and sometimes those languages give you too many features, so it can be kind of hard to tell what's going on. Pretty soon you need a config language for your config language. Um, loops, big deal. You can end up with a uh, uh, you know, a, a non-terminating config file. Uh, if you use something like JavaScript or Bash, and I've seen that happen, uh, Jenkins is a common place in our system, which is a uh, continuous integration environment. It's a common place where um, we'll write large Bash files in order to config things. And we've definitely written, you know, non-terminating loops in those files. So then uh, the other extreme is don't use any language at all. Um, you know, I, I say this kind of tongue in cheek, but there are places where they really don't have a language that you probably deal with. For instance, command line arguments. If you've ever uh, slurped in command line ar arguments from a bash file, you know that it's just anything goes, really. You know, it's just a big string, and then you parse the string however you want. It's really fair to say that that's a completely unstructured environment. Now, there are conventions that people use. You know, you'll see like uh, set, sets of argument conventions, but they really are just done by convention. Um, of course, I, I think that there should be a language. I think that you want consistent representations, you want consistent data organization, and you know, consistency everywhere. <laughs> All right, let's go through some really common uh, config languages. So the, the least common but the most functional is S expressions. Uh, anybody who's messed with Lisp knows about S expressions, or if you've ever tried to configure your own Emacs builds, because you're using the right text editor, then you know all about uh, these S expressions. And one thing that's wonderful about them is that they're durable, and what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, they've been around for years, and they're likely to continue to be around for years, so if you write them, people will know how to read them in 10, 15 years, you don't have to worry about it. Simple S expressions really only can be, they only have two parts, they have a, uh, you know, an action and then data that comes in, I love that. 
Uh, you can do things, you can do binding, so you can bind them to variables, which means you can have composition, which is a feature that a lot of these other things are gonna be missing, and I really like. So here's an example of an S expression as a uh, data record, right? So we have a plant, and then the plant has some fields. It's got a common name, a botanical name, a zone, uh, a light preference, price, and availability, all inside of this plant. So what are some problems? Well, first there's just like standard list problems, and that's what I was illustrating here. One of the weird things about S expressions is that there's ambiguity that's inherent in the type or in the uh, syntax. So here we have A, B, D, C. Both of these would be completely valid, and it's impossible to tell what's meant just looking at this. You know, you can't tell whether it's a B applied to a D and a C, or if it's a B applied to a D and then all applied to a C. Well, you know, you just can't, you just can't know that. Um, you know, usually these wouldn't just be named A, B, D, C, and so you might have some sort of suggestion by the names, but that's all it is. Um, too much power is the other thing. Uh, not only can you recurse at the value level, but you can recurse at the macro level, uh, which means you can write some really terse stuff that's really hard to understand. I mean, I, I love Lisp, but you can, you can get yourself in a bind in a hurry. Okay, XML. Honestly, XML is pretty good. It seems like in the mid-2000s, everyone decided they hated XML. Um, I guess they got tired of typing n tags, I think, which I don't, I mean, n tags are not fun, but there's a lot that they did right in XML. Uh, very clear delimiters. You know, the people who wrote XML, they knew about Lisp, they knew about, you know, curly brackets. It wasn't like they'd never thought of curly brackets. Um, what they were trying to do was make it very easy to tell where, when there was something wrong. So they put the delimiter at the beginning and the end of the, uh, of the code body. And it's something that's kind of cropped up over the years, different programming languages trying to bring this back and programmers rebelling against it because I think they don't like to type things at the end. Again, I'm, I'm no different. I, I hate typing things at the end. So um, just kind of explaining like that there was thought behind that. Um, other good things about it, it's, it's very clear. It's, it's one of the clearest data structures because every tag does have a name and it's ubiquitous. You know, every, I mean, everything reads HTML, every, I mean, XML, every web browser can read XML and most languages have an XML parser, so it's very ubiquitous. Here's some example XML in case you hadn't seen it. So I, I like to call this XML done the right way. Um, notice no attributes. I think attributes were a mistake. I'm sure that people who design XML would disagree and would have very good reasons to disagree, but I just have seen so many times that like people, it becomes arbitrary, and I'll show that here in a minute. But So we have a plant again. We have the common name, botanical name, zone, light, price, and availability. Um, I love how easy it is to understand what's going on, and if somebody forgot to fill one of these fields out, it would be very clear very quickly. Uh, this is what I was talking about with a, uh, with, a, with a problem, at least I think is a problem, is that you can also represent something as an attribute so it doesn't have to exist in a, in a form of tag and then data. You can actually have tag and then an attribute and then put data in here. And anybody who's messed with H HTML knows that those attributes get used a lot. Remember HTML and XML are very, very similar, both SGML family languages. Um, it, it is very verbose, like having all those end tags does add a lot of verbosity to your code. Um, and then there's no programmability, right? Like none of that binding that we were gonna have in S expressions is really available in XML. Um, so again, I, I do wanna stop and say, like there are fixes for all of these things for each of these languages, like there are workarounds, there are things that are added on, but I'm talking about just sort of the language at its core, because there are like programming features added to XML. JSON, all right, so, um, for a while, it looked like this was just gonna be the winner. Like, everybody was just gonna write all their configs in JSON, and then somebody probably wanted to make a comment about something and realized that you couldn't, and decided maybe that wasn't the best thing in the world. <laughs> so, for, I mean, you know, I, there was a, I would say a good three years, four years, where this was like everyone's answer to config files. And it's understandable that it's very easy to read, it's got a really, really crisp syntax. Uh, it's a really interesting thing handing somebody who's never even programmed before a JSON file and they can, they can just figure out like how it's supposed to go together and 
Um, I'm not sure you could say that about any of these things except for JSON and XML, that you, know, you can just hand somebody something and they just understand how it goes together. Um, one way of doing things, so in the XML example, you know, I showed attributes and um, then you actually have body elements. In JSON, it's really, there's data is data and the formatting is very, very obvious. Um, here's an example for some JSON. We have a plant, again, our plant is our, our favorite thing here. Um, it's gonna have the common name, botanical. Notice we have nested records here. So nice and simple. Um, so there are some problems. I think probably the biggest problem is there's no comments. I don't know how many people here do any front end programming, but if you ever deal with a, uh, you know, package.json or a webpack json file. They're both just irritating as can be because you can't comment them and you really, really want to write comments. Um, there are, again, there are workarounds, like there's whole like json preprocessing things. Um, in fact, one way you can use doll, which we're going to talk about is as a json preprocessor and it works really nicely for that. Um, no programming features again, so you have to use some other language to do that. Of course, it is ubiquitous, so it's, it's pretty easy to read it into some other language and then add programming features in. No schema, and you'll see a lot of uh, attempts to add schema to uh, JSON. There's all kinds of uh, schema for, uh, uh, formats, but it's not baked into the, to the uh, expression language. And so that's what I mean by no schema. Ah, uh, YAML. YAML. YAML was what I thought the right answer was for a long time. Um, partially because I used uh, the Haskell serialization and deserialization of YAML, which avoids a lot of the um, security bugs that occur in, in standard YAML. Um, interpreters, uh, but you know, YAML has a really clean syntax. I was actually generating a lot of config files for these for this talk and uh, looking at the syntax of YAML. I just really reminded me how clean it is. It's it's a very nice syntax. Um, no delimiters. It relies on white space to do your del uh, delimiting for the most part. Um, yeah, and the, the list syntax is like one of my favorites. So here's an example. Of course, I didn't do a list syntax, but still. Uh, same thing that we've been doing as our example, a plant, common, botanical, zone. And uh, you know, here I even have strings, but there are plenty of times that I've seen this without even the stringing for YAML. So you don't have to do that. You can just have these as fields and it'll just interpret it as a string. So it's really, really clean. Yeah, so um, Google YAML security problems if you want to know more about the different problems with YAML security, but there's a lot of problems with the way they handle, especially strings, in a full power YAML, YAML interpreter. Um, of course, again, like there's now there's strict YAML, which uh, solves a lot of those problems by not allowing some of the cyclic stuff that can occur in a uh, full power YAML interpreter. Um, there's no module system, which I haven't mentioned in the other ones. That, uh, most of them don't have it either, but there's no way of like organizing large uh, YAML configs into like separated files. And again, no programmatic controls. So um, I really think a little bit of programming goes a long way uh, in a config file. It's hard to know exactly where that line is. I think Doll does a good job of finding that line, but you know, um, everybody's preferences are maybe different. Okay, so let's talk about Doll now. And then first question is, you know, was it created by Roald Dahl? No, um, it was not. It was not named after him either. It's actually a character in a book, and I, I was just saying that I needed to look it up before I got in. I'll look after, the, after I get it done, but uh, I can't remember the name of the character. Um, again, it's got a clean syntax, uh, more programmatic features. I, I really think it does a lot of things right. Part of, part of the reason it does so much right is it's had a lot of, lot of experience to draw from, and. Uh, the guy who made it, Gabriel Gonzalez, he does a really good job of kind of bringing the best elements of different things together. Uh, it was inspired a lot by the Nix programming language, which is used for uh, configuring the Nix operating system and the Nix package manager, but he wanted a more typed representation of data, um, and that's why we have Doll. And I'm, I really like it. It took me a while to, to come around. Uh, some of the developers at, at my company started using it, and I uh, really like it. Okay, so let's look at a let's look at a record with our favorite plant example here. Uh, so, pretty pretty straightforward syntax uh, for simple stuff. So remember, I said I think simple stuff should be simple, and I feel like this really hits that. So a little bit of let binding here, but a plant is equal to this, and then each field has a name here. Um, you know, so very straightforward record syntax. Uh, the list syntax. 
I, I like it um, because it's like a true it's like a true list like you would expect in a type functional programming language. That that what I mean by that is that the internal element of the list has to have a unified type. Um, not true for most of the other languages that I showed, most of the other config languages that I showed, but I think it's a nice property. Um, so here's what lists look like. You'll notice that a lot of the syntax looks a lot like Haskell. Um, that's not a coincidence. Gabriel Gonzalez is a Haskell programmer. Uh, one thing he did do was he fixed it so it uses the right ty type operator, the single colon instead of the double colon. Most Haskell, I think, programmers would agree that Haskell made the wrong choice there. Okay, so here's some of the primitives you can use. We've got text, full Unicode support, doubles, all kinds of representation styles, integers and naturals. I actually really like that these are separated. Um, and then Booleans. You also have multi-line string support, which is really, really nice for, especially like say you're wanting to store a license file or do some sort of license configging. Uh, you can use these double single quotes to do a multi-line string. You can also interpolate in the string, so now we're starting to get into some programmatic features. So here we have uh, a text field named interpolation, and you can, you can reference it by its bound name also inside of this string. All right, let's add some binding. All right, so now we're going to have a let record here, and we're going to, this is a PREC as just the name I gave it. And so um, it's the same plant record we've been dealing with, but now, to, now I'm going to have it here and I'm going to reference it down here. So we're, we're, able to kinda com we're able to compose different let fields into a single thing. All right. But maybe we want to change one of those fields so that we can use sort of a structure and create a template and then fill in the value of that template. We can do that with lambdas. Now it's starting to look like some functional programming. So here we have a zone, and it's a natural number. This is a lambda function. That zone is then put into the record, and the entire record is returned as a result of the lambda. So then in plant equals prec4, that's going to set the zone equal to 4. All right, one thing to notice here, we're already starting to see types. Oh, God, types everywhere. Um, People's reaction are different when they see types. My reaction is very happy and that I know that things are going to be good and easy to figure out, but not everybody's like that. So why would you want types in a config language? Well, uh, I think the biggest argument is it means that you have um, a built-in schema. Um, you know, schema, the word schema generally doesn't quite mean the same thing that the word types does, but I think that they serve the purpose really well in Dahl. Um, in fact, there's some features that allow you to share that schema independent of sharing the config, which is an interesting thing. Um, types help you order and understand um, what's happening in your code. Um, and like this is saying, these are the good types. These aren't like the Java and C++ types. These are the Haskell and Scala types. So um, it's much better. And you know, the types in DAL are auto-inferred. So these examples earlier that I put, where you didn't see any types, that wasn't me just being nice, like you don't need to write the types for something like this. So simple things are simple, like I said. Okay, if we can have functions, next question is can we have functions that call functions? And the answer is yes. That makes me very happy. So um, yeah, so just as, this is just like a really quick example here. You can have a lambda function that takes a function that takes a natural to a natural, then also takes a natural and then applies that function to that natural, right? So a very standard app. Um, uh, I don't know. This is just the kind of thing that makes you really happy if you're into functional programming. Also, you can use Unicode syntax here. I actually had to have a special request made to turn off using Unicode syntax because we use this language ubiquitously, and I didn't want to have to explain to every new developer how you write a lambda. So we just use this syntax, but this is, this is definitely available. Notice these arrows, those are Unicode arrows, so you can use it like this, or you can write your traditional ASCII arrows. Um, yeah, it's just sort of a preference thing. Okay, now let's do some crazy things with lists. So the build function, um, 
So there is a prelude for DAL, so there's a set of functions and uh, types that are built into DAL automatically. They include things like uh, map and fold and build, which I'll get to. Um, we use build to programmatically construct lists. So you can think of that as like sort of the cons function, if you're familiar with uh, Lisp. All right. Uh, yeah. So this is the type signature of the build function. For all, and also you can use this in your type signatures. Uh, but you don't have to, you can actually write the word for all. So let's take a look at this and then I have a little diagram kind of explaining it. But it's for all A's. Uh, you have to set, you have to give it an A and then you give it a list and then you give it a function, your cons function, and then your nil. So there's a lot going on here. Here's a little bit of a breakdown. Like I said, you can use for all. This type is the type of types. So that tells you that you're going to do something that's sort of like a higher kinded type in this process. Um, it just means that, you're, that we need a way to refer to a type generically and that's what type allows you to do. Uh, yeah, the A here represents the type of the list. So this A and this A are unified. They're the same A. And then at the end of it, you get a list A. Okay, let's do an example. So this is an example of the code we just saw. Um, I'm calling build from prelude. That's what this means, list slash build. I tell it that the type that we're going to be dealing with is a natural. And then I write this lambda function. So the lambda function is going to take a list, a cons, and a nil, and then run this, cons one nil. And if you run this function, just like this would be how you would run it on the command line, you get back one, right? So that's one in the empty list. So just like what you would expect if you ran this at the command line for a Lisp interpreter. Any, any questions on this? this? There's a lot going on here. Okay. Moving along, we're all in agreement. All right, so let's take that build and we're gonna wave our hands and pretend I've also developed fold in the same way. Uh, and we'll write map. So again, map is available in the prelude. You do not have to rewrite this crazy function every time you wanna use it. But so here we have fold, fold deconstructs a list, and here we have build, build constructs a list. So it makes sense that an operation like map, you would see both of these. Right, so what we're doing is we're folding over a list, XS, and um, these right here are your type, your type parameters, so this is saying what A is, this is saying what XS is, right? So here we have XS, here we have A, and then here we have um, the list type, and then it's all being put together right here. So we have a lambda of x of type A, and we're consing it with a function applied to x. And then it just keeps doing that over and over and over. And then the results are built up here. Yay, I'm so glad that I don't have to remember how to do this every time I wanna use it. So map is a very powerful thing. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna move away from fun functional abstractions and talk about some other features in DAL. Um, one is the ability to name your types. So this is where it really starts to feel like a schema. So here I can name this type plant, right? And I can say that plant expects these three fields with these three types. And then somewhere else I can write, I can actually write a record. So this becomes an instance of plant, right? So now that's starting to feel really, you know, like a traditional schema and like say XML. And the doll interpreter will check this for you, which is really neat. Okay, and then I mentioned earlier that you can share these. You can share them either by storing them in Git or storing them really in any you know, web available um, place. Um, so what we're storing here is actually the definition of plant. So this part, this is all that's being stored. It's just the definition of plant. And then I can pull that back up. I can push that into some Git repo and then I can pull that back up in any code that I wanna use it and just write this down and make sure that it matches my definition of plant. Uh, so a couple things that are really cool about that, um, Git allows you to version, uh, you use, use hash versions, so you can actually make sure you're talking about the right version of plant and get that automatically by using Git's hashing. Um, you can also, of course, come up with your own scheme and your own um, 
place of storing these things if you need something more secure than like public git or you can use a private key git if you needed to. You can also turn off that feature. You can make it where you can't pull these things off the internet too. Um, functions can be stored as well so you can have some like um, you know uh, quick accessor with some default config uh, for instance, build plant. Maybe we have this big long definition of plant. Well, I don't remember what it was a while ago, but some big long definition of plant. And I just want one that that develops a very quick, uh, a quick definition of plant. I could I could store this build plant somewhere and then call it later. Both these features are 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 really interesting and add a lot of power to DAW. Uh, another feature record merging. So you can have some big long record and if you just want a function that changes just one little piece of it, you can use a diffing, uh, diffing slashes here and just change that one piece. So in this case, foo changes from one to two and then the final result is foo equals two and bar equals true. Um, and that's, that's, that's really nice. There are conditionals in the language. Uh, this is my favorite slide that I've ever made. <laughs> it's just nothing. <laughs> but but uh, it's, a it's a conditional, and you know, I mean, most config languages don't have them. Um, this one does, and I, I really like that it does. So if some condition is true, then you can do something here or do something here. These types have to be unified, so in other words, the then condition and the else condition have to result in the same type. Um, that's a very, that's a property very common for Haskell and I th and you know other functional programmers, but isn't isn't common throughout you know the whole world of if then else. Uh, yeah, and then there's all kinds of ways that you can take a doll file and convert it to some other config language because amazingly enough, this doesn't have universal adoption yet. So um, you know you can do doll to JSON, doll to YAML, uh, is it YAML or YAML? I don't know. Uh, doll to bash, doll to nix, that's a fun one. We've actually started doing a little bit of this. Um, but, you know, they all work really nicely, and I'll show some examples here in a minute. Ah, uh, we even have some types. I bet you thought we weren't gonna have some types, but we do. They didn't at first, but they added them later, and it's been great. So let me explain what's going on, because this is a lot of busy syntax, so now we're getting past the, the idea of like, you know, easy things being easy. I really wish this were a little bit nicer, but I understand why it is what it is, because they're wanting the language to be, you know, very transparent about how things are stored. So what we're defining here is a constructor for empty, a data constructor for the, for the empty type. So this is saying that empty is equal to this. This is the unit type in um, doll. And then person, alternatively, you can have a person and that person has a name and an age field with these types. All right, so then we probably don't wanna have to type all this every time we wanna talk about a person, so we construct, we make a constructor, a data constructor for person and make it equal to this lambda expression. So a person is equal to this lambda expression which just has the person part, whoops, which just has the person part and then embeds it inside of the constructed sum type. Here's an example use. Um, we're gonna make a list, and this list has uh, a set of points. In the first one, x is equal to three and y is empty, and in the second point, x is equal to two and y is equal to a person. So notice that uh, earlier I said that list types have to be unified, so these two do have the same type because of our uh, sum type here. Sum type, of course, allowing you to have disjoint types in a list. Any questions about this? Is it cool? Anyone think it's cool? I think it's cool. All right, good. Okay, that's all I have in terms of slides. Um, so I have other code. Let's see how much time I have. Oh, I have lots of time, cool. So um, I thought it'd be neat to kind of go through why this is useful, but first I guess I'd stop and does anybody have just any general questions? Yeah, Jordan. Yes. So Jordan asked if uh, doll is used uh, typically in Haskell, does it tend to be used in Haskell the most? And 
I, I think yes, it definitely does. I think that's changing. I noticed a doll to Ruby was there, so I, I don't know what's going on there, but that's really interesting to me. I, I want that to just take off. Um, I have a lot of respect for the Ruby community, and uh, they do a lot of good job with tooling, so that would be amazing. Uh, it used to be, in fact, that you could, uh, the only language that I think that had any kind of doll support was Haskell, but I think that that's changing now. Um, <laughs> One interesting language that using a lot of doll is ATS, so you can get an extra 100 people um, to use your language. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that the features will mean that it'll keep gaining support. Uh, Visual Studio Code now has a doll mode and actually has a built-in syntax checker in that doll mode. So if you've decided to use that instead of Emacs for some weird reason, um, you have that support. Now, Visual Studio Code's a good editor. I have like a bunch of Visual Studio Code programmers. Um, but it's definitely, it's, it's more Haskell-centric than, I, than I, I, I hope it gets more adoption by other stuff. I think one interesting target would be to get the Reason people using it and the OCaml people using it because, you know, I mean, this syntax, if you know OCaml, like the way that it's kind of approaching things, it's really more OCaml-y than it is Haskell-y, so, uh, or maybe semantics, not syntax, is more OCaml-y. I know somebody will probably, hopefully somebody will correct me if I'm wrong about that. But. Okay, so here's some, uh, here's, here's where I think that it really shines, and I wanted to kind of show this off. Let's see how much of it you can see. Um, so first I'll do some, well, maybe first I'll just show some littler examples of the, of the, um, the doll interpreter being used. So let's see. So hey, let me find that script here. So here's an example of using doll, uh, of using doll to make this uh, build constructor that we talked about earlier. So this is the, the notation it used to grab something off the prelude. Again, I'm saying it's a natural. Um, it takes a list, a cons, and a nil, and then runs it like this. So I showed this example earlier, but here it is on the interpreter line. Uh, let's see, how do I make this bigger? Uh, here we have uh, doll, which is the interpreter, and then I'm feeding input into it. So you can actually just run commands like this. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read from a file, but you can actually just run doll straight. Maybe I'll do that first, actually. So like you can do one, two, three, and I get one, two, three back. Oh, this is terrible coloring, isn't it? Uh, that doesn't help. Well, take my word for it, I guess. <laughs> Great presentation, Scott. Good job. So uh, yeah, so you can do that, but then you can also uh, just write a file and, and bring input in like this. And so then this is actually that build doll thing that we ran earlier, um, and it produces a one, just like I promised it would. I wasn't lying. I know you guys were worried. All right, so now let's go back to a familiar land of Emacs where I actually know how to zoom in and out. So um, let's see. Here's an example uh, export of some of a big giant JSON config. This is, don't don't worry about what these terms are. They're all a bunch of terms particular to my work, but um, I just want to see that this goes on and on and on and on forever. And there's a lot of data here, and a lot of that data is redundant over and over and over. Um, so what we were doing is we wanted to have a way to make it where somebody could use this export as a template to import something else. Um, so we transformed it into doll. Uh, the doll looks like several pieces. We met, built this function here. You can see like we started referencing types. These types are coming from a GitHub repo. And then we build a Lambda function that has all these records as an output. And you can see the pieces that, that change are put in as arguments like here, and the pieces that stay the same are just left in here as constants. Also, notice that this is a list of vpid sources, so vpid source is also coming in from the command line, 
or from the from the GitHub. So this this type is coming in. Let me show you what that VPID source is. So that's all this is. It's just a simple record explaining what that record is going to be. And then here is another type showing you know, all the different fields that you have to get. And then here's what the final, uh, the final program looks like. So it's just a set of those, right? So it's just the data you actually have to go collect by hand or you know, through some other script. And then everything else is automatically generated for you using this concat map takes that virtual parameter and an unrolled source and produces what you need it to produce. That's a really nice example. Also, I don't know if you can quite see it, but while I've been going, like everything's been type checking for me automatically in Emacs. And that's what I was saying that Visual Studio Code just added. So you can do that in Visual Studio Code now too. I've never done it, but I know that it's there. And I've seen it work in a, in a GIF, so that means it always works. Um, huh? Oh, sure, yeah, it's a great call. Let's make a new thing and I'll do some, we'll do some fun little type error stuff. Presentations. Yeah, so here's our, here's our, here's it working. And then let's do this. So this expects to be a type plant. So I'm gonna add something that not a plant equals I am not a plant. Oh look, there I have a giant type error. Right, so it's saying not expression does not an match annotation. So it's, ex it's saying that it should not have this field, not a plant, which we know because here's, up here you can see I, I've stored my type plant right here. So let me pull that up. This is what the type is supposed to be, right? So then I can fix it in one of two ways. Either I can get rid of this field or I can change this thing. So not a plant, and then we'll make that text save. Uh, there we go, and now it's a plant again, hooray. Uh, and then of course, if I then lift this field off, what are you doing, buddy? You just made that a plant. I don't understand you. You're very confusing. So get rid of it again. And there we go. Oh, not yet. And there we go. Type error fixed. So I don't know. That's a pretty neat little trick, I think, for a config language um, and, and really useful. Um, you start to you start to really kind of can go crazy with this. Um, that like I mentioned, the ATS uh, stuff they're starting to starting to do some really interesting configuration using doll packages. Um, Vanessa McHale wrote a uh, C builder uh, configuration with doll, and she has a really interesting post on um, sort of the, some of the problems that she found with that. It's really interesting. I'll put some links to it uh, on my notes, but um, yeah, it's good stuff. All right. I don't have a lot more to say about doll. I think, you know, it's it's a config language. Like, sort of start start to run out, but it's really cool. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Oh, also, people are trying to make this work in Nix. Like, there's been a lot of work to try and make this work in Nix. Um, uh, th really, the biggest problem is that uh, Nix. Oh, you know, I'm I forgot to mention an important detail here. This this language is guaranteed termination, right? So termination is guaranteed. So you don't have to worry about loops happening. Uh, and that's really what separates it from more, you know, more traditional languages you're using just like a regular language. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing. I probably should have had a slide about it. Um, sorry. Uh, there's some great tutorials. Uh, Gabriel Gonzalez is really good about documenting stuff. And if you're interested, you should run through those tutorials. And uh, I would love to hear if anyone's adding support for this to other languages. I hope to be part of adding it to maybe OCaml soon. So. Oh, I mentioned the termination. I mentioned the termination actually because I remembered the big problem with using this in Nix is that Nix does a lot of uh, fixed points, which is basically where you have a loop loop into itself um, and construct a fixed point uh, using recursion. And because this guarantees termination, you can't have a fixed point. Uh, that's probably not quite right. You probably can have a fixed point, but 
Uh, you can't have a fixed point in this language, so. All right, I'm, I'm getting out of my depth, so I'm gonna stop. All right, thanks guys. Thank you, Scott. You had one really big error, though. I just want to call it out, but uh, Vim is actually the best way to edit text. I don't know what you're doing with that Emacs stuff, but uh, no. no. Thank you. Uh, always appreciate your talks. They're always very good and high quality, so thank you very much. Um, don't have a whole lot else to say. Uh, one thing I'll mention, though, is uh, we've been getting a lot of attention on Twitter and YouTube with our talks lately. So those have been starting to get shared and circulated amongst a bunch of groups. So um, I just want to put that out there. If you're interested in having kind of a, a portfolio develop and get some attention on the internet, uh, this is a good way to do that. So I'm just going to put it out there. It is optional if you want to stream this and have it on the internet. Uh, but it is a, a channel that has been growing um, a lot amongst a lot of FP groups online. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out um, if that, if that kind of helps compel you to give a talk. Uh, but again, uh, always appreciate it and uh, hope to see you guys next month. Thank you.